All right, the last time we were together, I had, uh, we had stopped off at addressing things like the wheel, addressing the wheel, getting rid of debris, friability, how new cutting edges were formed. I uh, stopped the video, or I stopped recording, because I wanted to draw a line between these two topics. Uh, what we're going to go through now is really uh, more about ener energy consumption, the grinding process, more of the grinding uh, mechanics. And it's going to tie it in with, or I'm going to use it as an analogy for what we discussed when we talk about actual machine tool uh, mechanics. So you see the, the analogies between grinding and machining are still going to persist. So when you think about grinding, there's something I want you to keep in mind is that, you know, grinding is a very aggressive process. You know, it, it consumes a lot of energy, generates a lot of heat. It has the potential of generating a very uh, extreme and damaging amount of heat. Now, if we just look at this little diagram I found, uh, you can see that this is meant to look like a gear. And this is a wheel or a grinding wheel that's doing that final shape of the grinding or the gear's tooth. Right. So doing that final grind, you know, maybe making a very precise uh, gear tooth. So you can see the way it's trying to depict it is, you know, the grind is actually like, a, you know, the grit is going into the workpiece. It's removing material and it's generating a lot of heat. It's a very aggressive process. Now, the level of heat that it can generate, you know, potentially uh, can cause literal, you know, actually damage the wheel. You know, you actually are potentially going into a heat treat process. So if you remember the first couple of uh, sections of the semester, we actually talked about the phase diagram and, you know, if you raise the temperature on metal, you know, it goes through different phases and some of those phases are good for starting different types of uh, manufacturing processes. You know, it makes you more prone to certain types of things that can actually you know, change the quality of the material, you know, through the heat treating. And all of these things can happen during the machining and definitely during the grinding process if you don't know how to control them or if you don't know what to look for during that process. And that's what we're, this video is really going to be about. This one last one's going to be about. And this is the last one, I mean, the last section of chapter uh, 20, or last chunk of chapter 26. So grinding can produce that much heat where it literally starts to heat treat the process or heat treat the metal. You know, and by going through this heat, when it starts to get extreme, you know, it can actually do a lot of damage. You know, not only can it temper it, you know, and make it softer, you know, change the, the hardness of the material through heat treating, it can also burn the metal. You know, it can warp the metal, uh, make the metal more prone to uh, fatigue failure down the line, and actually can cause cracking, you know, immediate cracking in the metal, you know, a process or a condition called heat checking. So if we look at that gear tooth and imagine that that gear tooth has been brought to a point where it can be potentially burned. See, that's what this second picture is on the left or see on the right. It actually shows burning that's taking place in the gear tooth. And this is from grinding. So the temperature was raised high enough to actually cause the metal to actually burn. Um, and you can see in this FEA uh, finite elements analysis, it can actually get to the point where you can have premature failure. You know, so you've heat treated it, you've changed the material, and you have made it so that it will not have the same life it's supposed to have in the field. So, you know, the ability to control heat is extremely important. Now, these are just, that's just one condition. Another one, like I said, there was heat checking, you know, where the metal can get hot enough where it actually starts to crack. So, again, this is more burning. That here is this rotor, and you can see that it's been ground, and there's all these, this heat checking that's taking place. So again, you know, the, the heat can be very damaging. The amount of energy consumption can, can be very damaging. So let's try and understand what goes into causing this damage. What qualities, what variables are at play to, that you need to look out for when you're dealing with the wheel or you deal with grinding. So some of the things that can impact it. So this is just some of the variables that we're going to look into. You know, things such as the quality of the material, meaning just like some metals, are just inherently more difficult to machine. Some metals are going to be very difficult for grinding. You know, so there's going to be certain qualities, the hardness, the ultimate tensile strength, um, the, the toughness that are going to make it better or worse for the grinding process. 
generally causing more energy to be spent and causing more heat to be brought up. The grinding parameters, you know, just like with machining, you know, the, the how fast that wheel is turning, how deep you're trying to take that cut. Again, it can cause you different types of prop, potential problems and the quality of the grinding wheel. You know, again, so a, a wheel that is very coarse versus a wheel that's very fine, a wheel that's very hard versus a wheel that's very soft uh, can also have a real major impact on the amount of energy that's being transferred during this process. And again, the most obvious one is coolants. You know, so the coolants, not only do they reduce the temperature, you know, take heat away out, out of the process, but they can also provide a certain level of lubricity uh, to, to actually, you know, flush out a certain amount of swarf so that you can actually have a better grind. So these are some of the things that can come into play to help you deal with this potential uh, devastation. Maybe that's a harsher word than uh, needs, but but potential problem of the amount of energy and heat that can be produced through the grinding process to avoid, you know, damaging a, a, an expensive workpiece because grinding is uh, one of the more expensive processes in manufacturing, but also to help you avoid uh, long term damage. Like I said, you don't want something that's going to have a fatigue failure in the field uh, six months to a year later just because, you know, you had a heat treat problem that was imposed by your grinding process. So one concept I want you to become familiar with is grindability. Now we talked about machinability. You know, when we talk about machinability, we talk about cutting forces. We talk about uh, the, the ability to cut something uh, aggressively or have to cut it very conservatively. Uh, so again, your, your setup of your parameters are dictated. Uh, grindability is the same way. Uh, it's the ability to remove the metal through the grinding process. I guess it's a really basic definition, but it's also taken into account, much like machinability, things such as what kind of surface finish you can achieve, uh, what sort of tolerances you can get. So basically, it's your ability to grind to the to the parameters or to the standards that you want to achieve. So again, here is just a term used to explain how easy it is to grind a particular material, grindability. So again, and it covers things like surface finishes, quality of the surface, things like cracking, uh, waviness, uh, surface integrity, uh, how fast the wheel wears, you know, the cycle time. Same with machinability. A lot of these things are, you know, pretty much the same thing as machinability. Instead of, you know, a mill or a lathe, we're talking about a grinding wheel. You know, they can be greatly influenced by the cutting parameters, the tool and the coolant selection. Now, again, another thing that when we look at a lot of our grinding mechanics, you have a lot of the same uh, parameters, the same features that you would have in the machining uh, process. You know, you've got, you know, the diameter of the grinding wheel, you know, is going to come into play in calculations. The depth of cut, you know, again, that's just like with machining, you, you have to, you can adjust your depth of cut. Of course, grinding has a much lower depth of cut in general, but, you know, it's still something that needs to be taken into account. Uh, you have your tangential velocity, meaning that velocity as the wheel rotates around and there's an instantaneous velocity as it touches the surface, sort of like, you know, the wheel of your car. And then there's the relative velocity of the workpiece, meaning as the entire grinding wheel is moving across, that is your, your relative velocity. So those are the two, you know, when you think of those two different types of velocity, one is the instantaneous position on the wheel. The other one is as the mill wheel moves across the workpiece. And then the undeformed length. So that is just the amount that you use as your approach into the wheel. All right. But up here, you know, this statement I want you to keep in mind, you know, the grinding requires, you know, a lot of the same mechanics as say a peripheral milling process or a side milling process. You know, you think of it in a lot of the same way. Um, you know, it's just instead of cutting teeth, you got your grit or your grains that are doing the, the work. Uh, and then you can adjust things from from there in terms of what your thought process is. All right. So, again, you know, when just like when we were talking about milling, you have a certain amount of lead in, which in, in for a peripheral milling, I believe this is the exact same equation, the square root of the diameter of the wheel and the depth of cut. Uh, that's how you would calculate your approach into the grinding process. Uh, as far as your your chip thickness, 
you know, this equation is a bit different than the chip thickness we went over in chapters, uh, I think 23 and 24. Um, here you have this again, how fast you're moving across the workpiece four times that. And then this is your tangential velocity times CNR, you know, and then C is just a number of cutting points, you know, something you have to estimate. You can't really, you know, it's not practical to literally count the grain. So you have an estimate for that, you know, and it's, you know, the a range here that they, they actually give you. And then you've got your chip ratio. That's the lowercase r, which is the same concept as chip, the chip ratio when we talk about uh, milling or a cutting process, metal cutting process. And then of course, you get that multiplied by the depth of cut over the diameter of the of the grinding wheel. So, and this is how we calculate the what they call the chip thickness or how big the swarf is going to be in your process. So again, very analogous to the machining process. Now, another thing you have to deal with when you've got a grinding wheel going against your workpiece is the amount of force that this is going to generate. You know, again, you, we're talking about a very aggressive process. So if you can understand those grinding forces, just like when we talk about cutting forces, if you think of the merchant circle, the six forces that, that get developed to cause the merchant circle, you also have cutting forces that take place in grinding and that have a lot of the same sort of impact as uh, in uh, metal cutting. They deal with the amount of power consumption you're going to have. So how much uh, energy is being taken or consumed by moving that grinding wheel? You know, how much load is going to be on your motor during the grinding? Also helps you understand the deflection that can take place, just like with machining. You know, so the, the amount of thrust force that you do in machining can cause the workpiece to, to move forward or deflect. You can actually generate that same way with a grinding wheel. Now, one thing that's different, the cutting forces on the grain is proportional to the cross-section of the undeformed chip. There is some sort of an analog to that with machining, but, you know, since we're talking about the, the estimation of grain size, it's a, a little bit different in that one. But here we have the uh, basically saying that the amount of force, and this is where the material comes into play, is proportional to this relationship of your velocities and the square root of your depth of cut with the diameter of your wheel, all that multiplied by this UTS, which is your ultimate tensile strength. And what that's telling you is the amount of force you have going on here is going to have a proportionality to the type of material. So as you have seen in like some of our assignments, you know, the amount of force that gets developed changes from one material to the next. You know, so if you have a certain material that has a higher ultimate tensile strength, it's going to take a lot more force to cut through that material because it's stronger and it can put up more of a fight than it would for a softer material. It will be the difference between stainless steel and grades of aluminum. You know, those, some of those materials grind much easier uh, than others. Now, as far as the energy goes, when we talk about grinding, again, another thing that we were talking about as far as the potential for all those issues with the heat treating and the heat check and the burning, you know, you have to look at this as a energy per produced per chip. Now that sounds very tedious, you know, very dramatic to be able to say, okay, how much energy is each grit, each uh, uh, grain taken out? But when you think about, it, you've got to do an estimate to to get that number. You think about the activity that's taking place. You know, it makes sense that you know, just like in machining, there's going to take a certain amount of energy based on that material to end up removing that material. You know, the same goes with grinding. And this, you know, this you know, schematic looks a lot like, or this image looks a lot like what we had looked at all semester as far as machining goes. So what's going on when you're creating that chip, when you're removing that swarf from the material, you know, actually creating the metal removal, you're going through the plastic deformation. We went through that in the first couple of weeks of class. You know, the plastic deformation of actually moving, uh, getting the material where it doesn't recover and eventually goes and, and fractures and breaks off when the chip is formed um you know it's it also speaks to how much of a groove you're going to be able to take how much of a cut you're going to be able to effectively make you know how much friction if you remember the equations we went through when we were talking about frictional material moving across the, the force times the normal forces you know and that gives you your coefficient of friction you know the rake angles 
And this last one is important, the specific energy of the materials. So again, that's just like the ultimate tensile strength it has to do with the forces, the specific energy. Each metal has its own specific energy that it's going to take to actually remove that chip. And again, you know, we went over this before, you know, attritious wear. So just that flat wear of the material as of the chip as it or the, excuse me, the, gr the grain as it goes through the material. And again, with proper lubrication, you can reduce the effects of a lot of this energy that's going to be consumed. Basically, it saves your machine, saves your, your material, saves your wheel, uh, a whole lot of extra wear and tear. So this, we're talking about specific energy of the grinding wheel, or excuse me, specific energy that goes with the different materials. So here we have aluminum, and this is just generic aluminum. They don't change very much between them. Uh, we have cast iron, and here we go up to tool steel and titanium alloys. So we get various hardnesses for the different materials. Tool steel is uh, 67 Rockwell. See, that's actually very hard. You know, this is a different scale uh, for the other materials. The aluminum through the titanium are not nearly as hard as, say, tool steel. So aluminum, as you know, is, is a relatively soft material. Cast iron is, is harder than the, you know, the aluminum, but, you know, it's still uh, it's easier to machine, easier to grind material. And then, you know, you've got things like uh, low carbon steel and then titanium, which has its own issues because of the way it conducts heat. And then, you know, you got tool steel to compare it to. But over here is the part that I want you to look at. You know, the one is metric, one is uh, imperial. You know, the, the specific energy that it takes to go through each one of these uh, materials. So this is the amount of energy that it's going to take to consume a certain volume of metal in each case. And here you can see tool steel is significantly higher material or higher amounts of energy in order to, to consume that material. And there is a range to that. You know, they do show you a range, but... Here at the extreme, tool steel is the, the most difficult to consume, to, uh, consumes the most energy. Now, as far as guiding temperature, again, the, the other part of this, this whole discussion, you know, the temperature, you know, has to be controlled. Otherwise, you get a lot of those issues that we had spoken of earlier. Uh, you can get the residual stresses, the tempering, you know, the burning and the cracking or, or heat checking. So, again, this is an issue with dealing with coolants as well as knowing what are the proper parameters. So change the surface temperature can rise in proportion to how deep your, your cuts are, your wheel diameter and relative speed, or in other words, your cutting parameters. And this, again, you don't have to memorize this equation. I'm not gonna bring it back on you. I just want you to understand that that cutting uh, temperature, that you know the rise in temperature in the process is gonna be proportional. Again, the, de the diameter of your wheel, the depth of your cut, and the speeds. So if you can see, there's a kind of a theme with a lot of these equations, which I'm not, you know, I just want you to make note of them. You know, we're not going to actually have you, you know, test it on those, but just seeing that all these things are proportional to these same variables showing up in different, different forms. Now, <clears throat> that was it for as bonded abrasives. Now I just want to go through a few other, you know, processes and I'm going to put these slides online and you'll be able to see them because mostly it's videos and just going over the different processes of abrasive materials. Here we see this is uh, the whole family of abrasive machining. So here we have all your bonded grinding which we were just kind of going over until now. Here you've got the mass grinding or mass finishing. Uh, then you've got you know, fine finishing things like lamp, uh, lapping, abrasive flow, high precision finishing. And over here, you got the more high speed uh, abrasive finishing. So here you have abrasive uh, jet machining, water jet, and then you know just high speed high speed abrasives. So I'm going to close this section out now, and uh, I'll can I'll post this on Blackboard, and we'll start to move into joining.